So my name is Rushan. I lead the National Language Understanding Group at Facebook. Uh, before this, I was leading the National Language Understanding Group at Siri at Apple. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, why language understanding is key to enabling really compelling user experiences for people on Facebook. What are some of the specific problems that we're trying to solve, um, some of our techniques for solving those, um, and give some examples of you know, really nice product use cases that would not have been possible without uh, really sophisticated um, language understanding. So our, our kind of mission statement is we want to be able to understand all forms of textual and language content with near human level accuracy at Facebook scale. Um, so text is everywhere at Facebook. You know, even though people are posting more videos and images over time, um, text is still king in terms of you know, your Facebook posts, your comments, your interactions with people on Messenger. Um, and you know, being able to kind of understand this text um, is really critical to make sure that we can surface the kind of content that is actually relevant to people. Um, so let me give just one example of that. Um, so when I log on to Facebook, you know, of course, I want to know what my friends are doing. But I also want to know what's happening with some of the topics that I care about. Um, Well, um, so I care about machine learning, and I want to know about you know, machine learning conferences that are happening nearby, such as this one. Um, these are actually my boss's screenshots. He cares about hockey. I don't. So I don't really want to know about hockey, but substitute basketball there, and you get the idea. Um, so, so yeah, this is, and this is just one example. We want to be able to you know, surface you content for the topics that you actually really care about. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a lot more examples um, going forward as well. So, you know, when we say natural language understanding, what do we mean? There's a wide variety of tasks in that bucket. Um, I'll talk just about a small subset that are really important and interesting to us at Facebook. Um, and, but of course, there's, there's a lot more that we're just scratching the surface of. Um, so let's start out with, you know, text classification. Um, and some of you might be wondering, you know, isn't this a pretty standard problem? Isn't text classification solved? Um, you know, and yeah, you could kind of say that in certain situations. Um, but it turns out that you know, uh, people keep inventing ways of messing up our models. Um, uh, so here's, here's an example. Um, you know, this, this actually happened. So in the right pane, it's very clear that the topic is actually cooking. Um, in the left pane, you know, to all of us, it's very clear that the topic is sports. Um, it turns out that our models thought that the topic was cooking. And so when Joel made that post, he saw a bunch of cooking-related posts after that, which is <laughs> probably not the behavior he had in mind. Um, and, and so, so th there's all of these ways where you know, um, it's, it's, it's not as obvious as it seems at first glance. The other interesting thing is that usually in literature, people talk about text classification into 20 or 30 or 100 labels. Uh, but when you're talking about all of the content that people can post on Facebook, we're now talking about tens of thousands of labels. Um, and you know, being able to you know, achieve 90% on a 10,000 label problem is much harder than doing it for 100 labels. And so that's another challenge that we're constantly dealing with. Um, similarly, of course, we also want to be able to actually do word classification and label you know, every single word in a post as well, um, not just kind of the overall post. And I'll come to some more interesting examples of this later on. Um, Another really important use case for us is actually content similarity. So given two pieces of content, you know, how semantically similar are these? And again, this is one of those examples where if you just do superficial stuff like looking at how many words there are in common, you know, it just it breaks down really quickly. Um, and finally, parsing named entities um, from text is again uh, is a huge problem for us. So you know, if I if I post about you too a bunch of times. You know, if all I have is a topic model, I know that I care about music, but maybe all I really care about is you two and not all of music. And so I really want to be able to extract that entity as well. Um, and this again is kind of interesting because, you know, just to stick with this example, um, band names are really noisy. Sometimes they're words that don't exist in the English language. Um, sometimes uh, they're really common phrases. Um, and again, Sometimes people might have typos, uh, misspellings, abbreviations, but you want to be able to capture all of these just the same. 
Um, so you know, this is kind of a sampling of the kinds of problems that we really care about in order to do a good job of surfacing relevant content to folks. Um, and you know, how, do we, how do we actually go about solving these? Um, so it turns out that you know, we do something uh, pretty shocking. Um, we use deep learning. Um, yeah. yeah, so the, 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 the really interesting story over here is that a few years ago when we were starting to get serious about um, some of these problems, you know, we were starting to get worried about how to actually scale the amount of you know, feature engineering that we would have to write for different problems across different languages um, and how we would make that work. And you know, somewhat serendipitously around the same time, there were a lot of these seminal papers, um, including one from Facebook, that showed that essentially being able to run distributed representations of words and sentences um, as inputs to a neural network um, allow you to achieve state-of-the-art state performance on a variety of different NLP tasks um, without having to do any feature engineering, sometimes even using the same model just with multitask learning. Um, and so that kind of, you know, that theoretical insight came at just the right time for us. Um, and so that's what led us to start investing pretty massively in um, what we call deep text. So this is our internal machine learning platform for language understanding. Um, the, the, there's three main problems that we really want to solve with deep text that motivate a lot of our work even now. Um, so we want to be able to solve a, a variety of these NLP tasks, as I talked about before. Uh, we want to be able to support multiple languages. Um, and we want to have a, a variety of different you know, neural architectures in the same place. So what we want is for um, you know, a natural language engineer um, to be able to not have to worry about this task versus that or training a model for one language versus the other and essentially be able to kind of attack all of these different dimensions pretty much at the same time. Um, the basic, this is, this, is the, this is the only slide with a block diagram, I promise. Um, the, the, the basic idea is actually pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we consolidate all of our um, features in one place. These features could be as simple as, you know, uh, embedding representations of words. They could be, uh, you know, scores coming in from models elsewhere in Facebook. Uh, the, the idea is that you should be able to use whatever feature you think is necessary to solve the problem, uh, even if it's coming from, you know, an entirely different product or vertical. You put all of these in a central feature store. You allow people then to pick their model and their learning algorithm of choice. Um, and then finally, you provide a consistent way to publish these to production, um, either via an A-B test or directly. Um, and so this is kind of the platform that you know, uh, we've kind of invested in to make sure that the entire company can essentially operate at this scale. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the specific tasks, uh, tasks um, and some of the insights that we've kind of gotten from the work that we've done. Uh, so in particular, I'll focus on classification and sequence labeling. Um, so you know, I kind of alluded to what we mean by text classification before. You know, given a, a document where a document is either a post or a message or a comment, we want to figure out you know, what's, the, what's the topic that we're talking about here. Um, and actually, this is the least interesting slide. You can just throw it to an LSTM. Um, you know, take the, uh, run the entire document through the LSTM, take the last written state, put softmax on top, and you know, this, this is not interesting in 2017. Um, the thing that actually ended up being interesting is that uh, when we use con nets for document classification, um, because these can be fully parallelizable, unlike the computation in an RNN, uh, we, can a we can actually make these work an order of magnitude faster. Uh, and not only that, but the fact that you're using convolutions and that you're processing information hierarchically actually allows us to do significantly better even on long posts, um, which is kind of surprising because you might expect LSTMs to do better there. Um, and so, you know, one of the interesting insights um, for us was that it's actually better to go with connets for document classification pretty much any time you have that problem at Facebook. Um, there's another really interesting uh, new architecture that um, Facebook Research published just a few months ago, which we call fast text. So the idea here is that your features now are not the words themselves, but they're n-grams of features. And you don't learn embeddings of words, but you learn embeddings of n-grams. And you kind of use a neat hashing trick to make sure that your feature space doesn't explode. 
Um, and then your model itself is really simple. You just have one hidden layer. And so kind of the trade-off that you're making is that the model is simpler, but now your features are richer. Um, and it turns out that this actually achieves very competitive performance to LSTMs, to connets, uh, but is 30 to 40 times faster to train, um, even than CNNs. Um, and so what this gives you is that, you know, you can train a model for a new use case, provided you have the data within a few minutes and get a really good sense of what accuracies you can expect um, and what improvements you need to make in order to actually ship it. Um, and um, again, kind of putting this in kind of the same place as the other LSTM or the Connet models is, uh, again, really kind of, uh, it accelerates the pace at which people can kind of seamlessly switch between these different models. Um, talking about sequence labeling a little bit, again, you know, I'm sure this is very familiar to most of the people in the audience. The main difference over here is that uh, you're now labeling every token instead of the entire sentence, and so you don't really have to do kind of an aggregation across the sequence. Um, so, for example, if you're using CNN, you don't really need the pooling layer. Um, one thing that's actually not in this slide, but again, that we noticed, and there's a bunch of research from folks, including at Google on this as well, is that um, instead of predicting labels per token and optimizing for each token prediction, um, if you stick something like a CRF on top of your LSTM and kind of jointly optimize for your entire sequence, uh, you actually get significant improvements in recognizing named entities. Um, and again, that's, uh, it's hard to kind of ship that at production because that function is actually a lot slower uh, than vanilla LSTMs or connets. So one of the things that we spent a fair bit of time on is um, actually making it such that you could do this, you know, CNN plus CRF or LSTM plus CRF combination work um, at Facebook scale for every single post and message um, and comment um, in real time. Um, so this is actually one of my favorite models. Um, so this is what we call kind of the two tower model. So I, I talked about content similarity before. Um, and it turns out that something that works really well is, you know, if you have two pieces of text, um, you know, run both, of, run, run both of them through a CNN or an LSTM, take the hidden representations, put them into a single softmax, and then add a ranking loss on top of that. Um, and this actually ends up giving uh, a state-of-the-art performance in terms of figuring out semantic similarity between two pieces of text as opposed to just you know, syntactic or word-level similarity. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail on this, but another problem that we've been looking at a lot is what we call the entity linking problem. So, you know, let's say my models can figure out that in this case, Barcelona is a named entity and Real is a named entity. I still need to be able to map them back to the actual football clubs themselves and, you know, not map Barcelona to, like, the Barcelona airport, for example. Um, and so this is another area where, you know, we're kind of um, investing in quite a bit uh, because it's kind of key to uh, giving a really compelling user experience. Um, So I'm going to switch gears a little bit at this point and talk a little bit about um, some use cases um, that we were only really able to ship uh, leveraging some of this technology. Uh, so one example, um, some of you might have seen it, is kind of the marketplace tab in Facebook where you can actually list stuff to buy or to sell. Um, and one thing that we noticed which is kind of really interesting and drives usage of this function a lot is you know, for people who don't actually know that this tab exists, can we actually detect the intent to sell just from a regular Facebook post? Um, and not only that, can we actually parse out what they're trying to sell, what price they're trying to sell it at, and kind of automatically create a marketplace listing from that? Um, and without that, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's just another Craigslist, right? Um, so that was actually something where, you know, when we were able to deploy that using some of these deep text models, um, engagement for this feature um, just, just took off. Um, so this is one that I am actually really proud of. Um, so this is what we call the social recommendations feature. So the idea is that, you know, you want to be able to ask your social graph for recommendations. Um, and the way the feature works is that, first of all, we detect that there's kind of the soliciting recommendations intent. Uh, we also detect what it is that you're actually looking to be recommended about. Is it um, a local business? Is it uh, travel recommendations for a new city? Um, and then once people actually start commenting, um, we parse all of the comments and we pull out all of the relevant recommendations themselves. Um, and not just the mentions, but also linking them to like actual 
places in the Facebook knowledge graph, places or uh, businesses or what have you, and then kind of overlaying all of these on the map. Um, so this is something where, again, you know, it's, it's actually really easy to do once you have all the AI building blocks in place, um, and it's just not doable at all without it. Um, so this was one of our first uh, features that was really kind of powered by deep language understanding from the get-go. Um, I don't have slides over here, but another feature that a lot of you might have seen, which is, again, powered using a lot of the technology that I talked about before, is what we call end suggestions. So when you're talking in Messenger and, you know, if you're, if you're trying to make plans to watch a movie or to go to dinner with, you know, three or more people, it's, it's, it's like herding cats, right? Um, but, but if we can detect that that is, in fact, what you're trying to do, and if we can actually detect, you know, what places people are suggesting, maybe make a poll out of those, or maybe see if you know, we can get you an Uber. The way we see it is you know, we're taking this social coordination exercise that's kind of inherently quite difficult, but we're lubricating it as much as we can based on our deep understanding of what people are talking about. Um, so, and then switching gears again a little bit, uh, one of the things that uh, we've been thinking about a lot is, you know, how do we kind of get maximum leverage from all of these pieces that we have talked about? Uh, so for example, you know, how do we get it to a point where all of these models can be trained not just by, uh, you know, machine learning or natural language engineers, but uh, by an order of magnitude for more people, right? Uh, how do we reuse models that might have originally been developed with one use case in mind uh, for a variety of different use cases? Um, and how do we actually get the most bang for our buck just in terms of our annotated data, right? So this annotated data is costly to come by to begin with. And how do we make sure that, you know, we're only really annotating high value pieces of examples and, you know, not things like hi or call mom. Um, so with that in mind, one of the things that we built is what we're calling Clue, or that's the content and language understanding engine. And so the way this works is, you know, it's, it's very much a self-service model. So if, if you're a developer, whether that's a second or third party developer coming in, um, you can collect some data by searching um, some of our um, unlabeled corpus. You can, you know, label a handful of examples yourself, uh, bootstrap an initial model, which may not be perfect, but hopefully it should at least be sensible and good enough. Um, and then you can really, you can review and you can see what are the examples where the model is the least confident or where labeling those would move your numbers the most in terms of your test sets. Um, and so what we've been able to do with this Clue platform now is that at Facebook every week, uh, you know, more than 200 models are trained in a purely self-service manner uh, without any involvement from my team, um, you know, across a bunch of different uh, products in Facebook, whether it's feed or ads or, you know, Messenger. Um, so I think that's actually my last slide. So, you know, this is just a kind of a broad strokes, high level overview of all of the different places where, you know, we are, you know, heavily dependent on language understanding in order to actually make our products work the way they're supposed to. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're not hiring. Actually, I'm just kidding. Uh, we're hiring as well. Um, so yeah, uh, please come see me later if you have any uh, questions. Thanks.